Hi, everyone. Um, if I didn't get around to see you at the at your table, I'm Rob Kelly, one of the co-founders and council along with Stephen Armstrong, and um, we're going to kick things off. Um, normally at this time, uh, it's Stephen and I walking around a room trying to get uh, people into the um, into the session. Audio broken. Are you not hearing my audio? Um, this microphone is on. Are you able to hear? We're hearing you. We're hearing you. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so exactly. Yeah, John, if you could pop off video for now, we'll have you come back in in a bit. Okay, good. So, so Stephen and I co-founded Maple Business Council. As I was saying, normally at this time, it would be dragging people from tables, and it usually takes us 10 minutes to make that happen. Um, but it was... Uh, somewhat similar this time and um, uh, really hoping that we can um, we can uh, have a great uh, opportunity for people to network as well as uh, walk through our presentation. So I'm going to share a screen presentation. Okay, so just um, a pointer um, uh, as we're going through the presentations today. Uh, you should now see this um, screen. It's sort of taken over your uh, your screen. And in the upper right corner, you'll see these four arrows that would allow you to make it full screen. Um, so you can feel free to do that. And, and to get back, um, I believe then there's a, a close button to get out of full screen or back to presentation, something to that effect. And on the right-hand side, there's a little chat window. So if you wanted to chat, you could do that as well. Um, and within the chat, there's an opportunity to ask questions. So um, just a couple pointers there. Good. So I'm going to start going through. Um, welcome to our session. Uh, we had some online networking. We're going to give you a quick report on Maple. Uh, and then we're going to shift to our first presentation from uh, and then on to our second, which would be Taria. And then afterwards, we're going to we're going to drop back to the tables. Um, and hope you have an opportunity to continue uh, networking for a little while. So, um, you know, as you were using today, um, and I know that many that I spoke with were using it for the first time as well. Um, and so we hope that, you know, what this is doing is it's giving us uh, a different networking experience than our typical um, webinars. Um, uh, we hope that you know, as long as we're not able to get together physically, we find ways to to do things like this to bring, um, you know, sort of new platforms to the table and, um, you know, use them in future events. We also, you know, Steve and I were talking for, for years about, gee, we should, you know, do webinars or maybe even live cast our meetings, and we never did. Um, and it, it's, I think there's going to be a period of time where we're in a, a hybrid mode. Um, you know, even after the vaccine gets out that, you know, even if some of us can get out to meet, we may not all want to do that or may not be able to do that. And so um, I think we're going to continue in a hybrid mode um, going forward for some period of time. So we're looking for tools like this to help us. Um, as you would recommend or sorry, as, you, as you'd uh, recognize already, um, uh, you're Point. Um, if you have any questions, please, you know, hit us in the chat or the Q&A. Um, and I think you can also raise your hand in the chat window. So if you wanted to come in and speak on something, you could do that as well. Um, and uh, it says we're recording. I'm not sure how that's going to work out, to be honest with you. Um, I did hit record when I started my presentation, and we're going to ask the uh, presenters uh, when they are given that option to do so as well, and we'll do our best to get these presentations to you uh, in the end. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about our growing community. Um, so I want to welcome our newest member. Uh, so we've got uh, Dorsey and Whitney, a large um, who has a large Canada-US practice uh, and is represented in Maple by three partners. Um, Sarah Robertson, head of trademark practice, um, who's based in New York, sort of lead a relationship with the firm. And then I want to also uh, thank Ted Lau earlier. I didn't see Robert uh, 
but um, I, I welcome both of you. Um, Ted, it's great uh, after our chat a little while ago, see you join. Um, so he's got a uh, uh, digital design agency, uh, Ballistic Arts, and then Robert Samaran is a business development manager in Irvine for CETA Software. So welcome to Maple, appreciate you guys joining. And then, um, you know, the Maple community uh, really, you know, we look at our metrics, uh, you know, how are we doing? Is, it's, is, it, is the community growing and are members renewing? And so uh, many thanks to our renewing members, Aphex, Krillix, Cummings and Partners, or Cumming and Partners, uh, Vancouver Hotel Destination Association and Westmark Tax. So thank you very much for your renewing commitment to Maple, and um, we continue to appreciate your support. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Stephen. Great, thank you, Rob. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great, and just to let just this question, Rob, um, do I have slide control or not? Um, no, I, unless you wanted to share, but I can just uh, advance okay. the slides for you. All right, super. Thanks everyone for joining us today. You know, this is our last event of 2020. So take a little stock of what has happened in a very challenging year for us all with respect to our community. And it's been a remarkable year of growth. And we're so grateful for the participation and support of so many who have enabled us not only to survive 2020, but actually grow our footprint. Um, on the next slide, please. If we look at membership as an example, uh, we've had a record number of organizations join Maple this year, uh, fully 19, uh, either as uh, organizations, um, executive members representing their companies, also a young professional membership tier that we launched this year as a way to welcome um, entrepreneurs and young business executives who are growing their network and are building their career and, sharing their passions uh, so that we can continue to have uh, fresh ideas and new blood in an organization. Uh, we think that's extremely important. Uh, it's been exciting to see that these new members, well, about half are from outside our home base in California. So you see uh, we have Columbia, Ontario, and Quebec all represented. And also this year, uh, a few of our members really stepped up and not only renewed but elevated their membership in our community. So we want to especially thank the IP law firm, Lee Martins, uh, based in Southern California, the Toronto Stock Exchange and the TSX Venture Exchange, the province of Ontario, and SQA consultants for all, um, you know, investing even more in our community as we grow our footprint across the United States and Canada. Next slide. And truly our, um, our community has grown. As we look at um, our presence in the United States, uh, on our fifth anniversary in June, we celebrated by opening up our New York chapter. And you might've seen John Costanzo a little bit earlier or in a meeting uh, uh, networking space. Very honored to have John join our executive as our leader in New York region. Uh, John is the former uh, president of Pure Later International and has a distinguished uh, career in supply chain internationally and uh, has been doing some great things for us in planting the maple flag uh, in that part of the U.S. We've also uh, been excited to deepen our roots in Vancouver, where we've been active for over three years now under the leadership of Jason C. And, uh, this year we um, formalized our organization support for Jason with a full maple British Columbia chapter. So look for even more information on uh, upcoming events, more programming, member mixers. And uh, Jason, um, you know, did a wonderful fireside chat with the incoming U.S. Consul General Brent Hart upon his arrival to Vancouver for the business events he did and followed up with an interview with Jason for our Momentum newsletter. So um, um, Jason has built some really wonderful B.C. U.S. ties uh, for the benefit of us all. We also feel it's very important for us to look at with diversity in mind. And uh, this year we um, uh, were honored to welcome uh, three women business leaders to our board and advisory team. Anna Innes, who is with us here today, is on our board of advisors. Delilah Panio from the Toronto Stock Exchange is on our board of advisors. Sam Panambalam, who is the founder 
and CEO of a cybersecurity firm, um, XA Hive, with offices in Ottawa, LA, New York, and London, England. And we're grateful this year for our work recognized by the LA Chamber with their annual leadership award with respect to promoting international trade and uh, collaborations. Next slide. From a programming standpoint, uh, I have to take a breath when I say this, we hosted 21 events in 2020. Uh, it's a record for us. And, uh, you know, this, you know, after our last person event in March in Vancouver, which I think was one of the last networking events um, in the city, uh, a little too close, you know, for, uh, for what was happening at that time. We've um, successfully moved over to webinars and uh, on more than one a month basis, we've been hosting programs with a wide variety of topics being the USMCA Kuzma trade agreement um, and working with our partners in New York, um, in uh, Canada and here in Southern California. Um, and many of these are available for you to view on a webcast recording basis on our website on YouTube and Vimeo channels. So there's some wonderful content there to help inform your business planning uh, that we encourage you to, to check out. And as we look at um, our community too, it's, it, these events are extremely important um, because it's a chance for us to say hello to one another and to um, you know share our work. But we also um, have been very busy um, providing content platforms outside of events to be able to tell stories and share our expertise. And our members have shared already this year 19 different articles in our monthly momentum. And we've got our December issue coming out next week. Uh, and through this platform, we've interviewed a variety of economic and political bridge builders. I mentioned earlier the U.S. Consul General for Vancouver, also the U.S. Consul General for Canada and York, Kawar Nassim, among others. Um, and then we continue to produce our videos uh, where we're actually sitting down and having a conversation with our members and most recently had chats with uh, Apex in Los Angeles about the Canada-US dollar uh, relationship and how that's evolved this year. Uh, in addition, we have our regular programming newsletters, blogs, and just a lot of social media out there because there's so much for us to tracking. But what we want to be is a bit of a curator and a filter for our members and our followers so that if you're looking to dial into these markets where we're active, that you can stay abreast and keep on the pulse of what's happening in Canada and in key US markets as well. And I'm not going to read these names, but you know we are really honored to play a small role in the greater um, ecosystem of economic development and cross-border collaborations. And when we took a look at work with some form of collaboration, uh, either hosted an event to get folk, um, you know, shared uh, what we're doing with one another, the list uh, got pretty long. And so I think you know for all of us navigating the white waters of COVID right now, we all probably have recognized the power of community and the ability for us to take strength from one another. And, you know, I take a lot of heart in the fact that all these associations are following their missions to the betterment of their communities. Uh, and I think this speaks to recovery and the speed and the quality in which we can all get back to um, how we used to live and work. Um, and so um, it's been an honor and a privilege to meet some individuals who are, you know, leading their initiatives in their respective markets. And, um, you know, we are looking forward to continuing to work within this broader ecosystem of partners. Next slide. So where does this all take us? So where is Maple today? We're actually an organization of about 100 members. And our members represent 20 different business domains. And you see how diverse it is. There's not one or slice of the pie that is significantly larger than the rest. And this was really by design that we, when Rob and I and our co-founders set out to uh, nurture and grow Maple, it was really under the, 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 the vision of being a where so many of us can come together, get out of our traditional swim lanes and discover interesting opportunities to work not only across border but across sector and so our membership now reflects that in the 20 different sectors that you all uh, represent. Next slide. And so where are we? We have membership 
Canadian and U.S. markets. Um, and what's exciting is that a lot of our members are outside of, of individual markets where we have a formal chapter. Uh, so our members in Canada um, include uh, British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec. John is growing our membership in uh, the New York region. And of course, our strength has been in California since we began five years ago uh, here in, in Orange County, LA, and San Diego. And so if you look on the next slide of where the kind of the, the net mix is, 60% of our members are in the US and about 40% in Canada, which we think is a really good reflection of and that's a lot of great opportunities for us to learn from one another if we're looking to take our business to Canada or if we're looking at opportunities to go stateside as a Canadian business. So that's really kind of where we stand right now. And what I'd like to briefly say is that we are actively planning our 2021 calendar. And uh, the things that we're keeping in mind on the next slide uh, are that, you know, we're going to continue to connect with one another on a monthly basis online, you know, as we all continue through recovery. Um, and today is an example of how we're looking to enrich our networking experience online by trying different things to try to bring us together and make it a more meaningful point of contact. We are very much a network of communities, and we're excited to be working on an all-network mixer in uh, the latter half of January. The focus will be each other and not a formal presentation as a way for us to meet fellow members in, uh, across Canada and the United States and recognize the, the power of, of what we have together. Um, and we'll continue not only to be uh, promoting uh, opportunities through events, but also education through our content platforms as well. So if I could leave a parting thought on the next slide with the um, you know, opportunities going forward, is that we think that we have a unique way of connecting Canada and the United States. And play a, an individual or corporate member of Maple, we invite you to really take a look at what we do closely and we'd be happy to talk to you offline about the different membership plans we have. You know, we're kind of like National Public Radio, you know, you can listen or you can be a supporter. And, you know, it's the support and the participation that, you know, is the, the um, yeah, rocket fuel that helps us grow this community. And so we, we, um, we would encourage you to look at how you can get involved more and what kind of benefits that we can share on your behalf. Uh, and through this work, we're really proud to work with the Consulate Generals of Canada, U.S. Commercial Service, and all the economic development stakeholders that are invested in this Canada-U.S. relationship as well. So with that, I would like to say a few remarks about our next speaker, and this is not on a slide. Um, I just want to say how excited we are today to welcome um, Power Shifter to uh, our event today. Um, we got to meet Power Shifter through uh, their business with us here today, who attended a number of our events that Jason led in Vancouver and got to learn a little about, about the digital design work that they do um, for major organizations and enterprises across Canada. And we're delighted that they were able to become a corporate member of Maple earlier this year. And I think you're going to find the talk from JP Alaka, their founder and CEO, and Priscilla Ho, their lead UX uh, researcher and designer really as they profile the type of work that, that they do for their clients and it will a little window on thinking about digital design that I think is becoming more and more uh, significant as we're all living um, in this online world and how do we make that user experience as meaningful and impactful as possible. So JP and Priscilla just delighted to have you with us today and I'll see you now. So I think if you guys just turn your cameras and mics on, uh, you should also be able to go ahead and share screen. And I'm going to drop off now and leave it to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. All right. Thank you, Robert, Stephen, and Jason as well for inviting us today to uh, speak to all of you. Um, we're coming to you from Vancouver, for wherever you are. And uh, this is pretty cool software that's the first time I've used it. We've used quite a few um, virtual um, events um, platforms recently, as you can imagine, and uh, this one's pretty cool. Our company actually would be has the technical capabilities to actually design uh, design something like this. Is kind of what we do. I'm just going to get my screen share up here.
All right. So we are PowerShifter, as mentioned, and today we're going to be talking to you about um, customer experience um, needs in uh, during COVID, um, COVID-19 and beyond, and then how lean service design could possibly be a way to pivot or adjust your needs or your customers' expectations. As mentioned, uh, I'm JP Hilleka, founder and CEO. I started off as a designer and have now been uh, in my way up to um, CEO and um, I guess lead strategist. I still do some strategy on the work. And I can assure you Priscilla and I are at least six feet apart. I think it's safe, and this is Priscilla. Hi everyone, I'm Priscilla and I've had the privilege of working in different industries through the marketing area. And now in design, I'm seeing opportunities here on really helping people understand why things are happening and the value and the impact to them. All right, so. So we're PowerShifter in Vancouver. We've been doing business for 13 years, uh, helping clients navigate the complexities of uh, designing and building and scaling uh, the right digital products um, for your customers. And part of what we do is service design, which is really understanding your end customers. But not only that, it's the people, the processes, the tools your business has to connect and make people delighted with your product or service. And we do digital product development. Otherwise, um, or previously, we've been known as software or apps or web applications, things that are complex that um, need to do a job heavy lifting. And as you can imagine, in the era of COVID, with digital transformation, um, there's a big need for solving problems with digital products and services. And Go ahead, JP. And web design, finally. This is where we started. Our roots are in web design. Um, and we, as, uh, as things got uh, more um, sophisticated and needs for customers started coming to us wanting applications of web applications, we started to move in that space. So we're, we're really um, primarily focused on product development and service design, and now web design is probably our, our third busiest area. They're all interrelated, as, um, as you can imagine. And quickly, um, just some people that we, some brands that we work for, some you may know, some you may not. Uh, we've done all kinds of work over the years for, for brands like this in Canada and, and, and in the U.S. too. We've uh, recently worked, uh, we worked with um, Western Union, Fitbit, um, and most recently, a uh, Canadian brand just down the street from us, um, Lululemon, doing some work with their, um, with their innovation team on some stuff that's uh, going to be exciting upcoming. All right. Wanted to share some sort of paint the landscape here for for everybody as to what it's looking like with with regards to um, the CX uh, to the COVID uh, landscape for regards to business. This recent study from um, Ohio State um, came out. Uh, Eighty percent of business leaders said that they're more likely uh, to see significant long-lasting changes in how they organize their work and how they interacted with their customers which is not a small number and obviously poses some deep challenges. In fact, um, anecdotally, just the other day, um, I, had, I saw um, an interview with um, the head of the American Independent um, Restaurant Association saying that if the current wave continues into the spring, that's between 60 and 80% of independent uh, restaurants in the US most likely won't survive. That's a pretty shocking number. And um, so today, what we're going to do is provide some tools that um, could be used by your business to look at ways in which you can make adjustments if you need to uh, without significant investment of time and resources. Because as we know, things are changing quickly and uh, we need all the tools we can. The tool that we're going to talk about or the service with strategy um, is something called service design. And what service design is defined by McKinsey, there's three questions we ask that's common to every project. So the first one, how human is our service? For example, when I worked at CTV News and it was getting bought up by Global Bell Media, they forgot 
to think about who are the people that we want to engage. Instead, it became, how can we create controversy? And so I think that asking that question of how human is our service is number one, the most important. The second one, how economic is our service, working at a agri-food business, it could basically look at how do you hire multiculturally so that you can address when we do sales in Santa Barbara, in Japan, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, what is that value we provide to all the different countries? Because it slightly differs across different cultures. And lastly, can our people scale it up? So working at a YouTube company that started with eight people and now they're 300 because of the gaming industry, it's really about understanding all the different pieces and touch points that make your service great for your end customers. So how do we thrive and adapt quickly uh, in a continu continually shifting omni-channel landscape? That's what we're gonna dive into today through service design. We're gonna keep it uh, work, uh, in a workshop style as if we were presenting or we were in a workshop. Um, theory is nice, but I think in times like this, we need practical tools in which we can actually use um, to, to improve our business, to make adjustments as we see, uh, as we need. And so today we're gonna take you through a mock, um, a mock workshop. Uh, this workshop would actually take place over you know, many hours or even a couple of days, depending on the level of complexity. Um, but uh, in this one, we're going to explore a common a common challenge that has been solved uh, to to keep it um, um, relatable. And with lean service design, the concepts are all the same in terms of what's the business value, what's the viable solution that's also desirable for customers. But at the end of the day, it's all about bringing the right people to the same room, digitally or in person, who have that experience with the end customer and who have the decision-making power to make a difference in the new strategy. And so this canvas that you'll see is a lot about how do we help co-create a right solution for the next step. Yeah, not top down, uh, but um, inviting as many members and stakeholders, whether it be business um, internally or whether it be customers, and really, lead service design is something that should not really be studied. It's something that um, should be applied. It's a it's a quick uh, quick way to start to do tests in business. So there are five components to lean service design that we're going to explore today, and they are um, we start off with the with the people canvas, which is really about your internal needs of your of your employees and, or or your customers. Then we'll get into purpose. What's the purpose for making this decision, a business decision, or change in the way in which you operate, or adding a service or, or, or product? Um, then the next canvas is uh, opportunity. What is the opportunity that you uh, that you've seen, that you've identified, that you can um, then change or, or adapt your business to? Then it gets down to the ideation. Otherwise, we used to call it brainstorming. But uh, ideation: How can we solve a problem um, to take a use of that opportunity? And then lastly, we get into the experimentation phase. And you know, working quickly with the ideas, we want to get them into market and want to start testing things to see if they indeed are um, the hypothesis is true. And if they are, you can you know, proceed uh, and then develop it further. And if they're not quite right, go back into the opportunity and idea phase again. Again, not looking at doing months, months, uh, months of time at this. You know, needing to move quickly. And these are the five five phases. Oh. I forgot I had a little animation here to highlight each one. There you go. And these take place in the form of canvases. So if you're familiar with the strategizer business model canvas, you know that different rectangles help you focus and simplify complex concepts. So what you're about to see is five different ways to look at the complexity within people, purpose, opportunity, idea, and experiments. And those boxes are really where you can start to have brainstorms with many different people cross-functional in your organization so that you don't, so that you avoid silo thinking where you're, it's just you thinking with maybe a few people. You wanna involve everyone in this kind of brainstorm method. Yeah, and this also provides, uh, this framework provides a repeatable structure. It guides you in a way when you've got a problem, it's always nice to have guidance. It's nice to have frameworks where you're not having to uh, sort of be in the dark. You can go through uh, a known successful process repeatedly. So you're not learning the, the, the system, you're focusing on solving the problems. So shall we take it for a test drive? So today, uh, as I mentioned earlier, 
uh, we're going to uh, work through um, a hypothetical problem that we've all seen most likely in our um, neighborhoods that's been solved um, by restaurants that are, of course, not doing so well. Noted the, the statistics earlier. Um, those that are thinking on their feet, I know in Vancouver, we've had um, some that have moved into the, into the grocery business. So we're going to take this example as if they had done this workshop themselves um, with their team um, to figure out what it is that they can do to solve the problem of um, nobody, nobody, uh, nobody in their shop, they've got food to sell, and there's a need, but it's a different way of doing things. So with the people canvas, in terms of business strategy, it's really important to use empathy to step into the shoes of the people that we're designing for. Personas are often design tools and methodologies that we use to help really dig into the people that we're designing for. So what is the deepest motivation? What do they believe in? What's really important to them and what do they hate? What are their friction points? What are their pain points? These are the kinds of questions that we use to help us really step into the shoes of the audience that we'll be strategizing for. Yeah, and in this example, for we, we see that um, they've identified that there are people that are locked down in COVID and we've got employees and staff. Those are the two personas that we were dealing with. And uh, the needs from the people perspective that are in lockdown, they need to safely get groceries for their family. Um, in the in the values area, there's a you can see that there's a different types of values or emotions that are going on. And here, they want to minimize their exposure and play it safe. So we've got that down in this canvas to identify the values that they're they're thinking, so we can get into their shoes. What are the problems and their fears? Well, grocery stores are packed. They may not be close by, and uh, there's a lot of people. So there's fear of potentially getting exposed to COVID. So that's the that's the problem. This is what they're thinking. How do we play it safe? And, and this is their their need. Next canvas. The purpose canvas. So this one is where we help prioritize what are the most urgent and important steps to address first. And a lot of times I think people get blindsided by focusing on what's the most efficient or time-saving option for the business and they forget to match. How does that match the customer's needs? How does that match the customer's pain points? So in this instance, um, so we know we've taken from the previous canvas, we've determined that there are people uh, from the personas, there's people in lockdown due to COVID-19. They need for, uh, there's a need for family, uh, they're for groceries for their family, um, and they can't really venture far from home at, when they need their groceries, that's a negative. So we see that um, as they may, we will make our way down the screen, there's a positives and negatives. On the business side, we know we've got partners to deal with that we've got to pay and keep them going. We've got clean uh, and sanitation suppliers, we've got uh, food suppliers, um, and um, we need to look at making sure that we're cost savings, we're including labor and HR, all kinds of things that keep our businesses going. So those are our business needs. How do we how do we keep those keep those running? If we get a new idea, do we need to get new food suppliers? Um, do we, how do we train the, task, the team to make changes? How's their morale? Will they be able to adapt to a new kind of concept? And we move, um, and then um, lastly, um, we have the space and we have the space for storage for groceries and we need to keep revenues from, from crashing. Those are our needs. So that will take some time to go through and then we move over to the opportunity campus. Yeah, and before we move forward, there's a question in the chat here from Ron. How do you capture this information from the teams participating? So we often use an online digital whiteboard called Miro. Uh, there's a lot of other tools out there to capture this. But basically, everyone signs into this uh, kind of digital whiteboard environment, and everyone can put their own post-its on. Alternatively, if when we're in person, it's a lot of fun to really use paper and Sharpies and pens to get their own thoughts and then post them and share it with the group. Yeah, like a classic brainstorming session, you'd be in the room and you'd be rotating people through and coming up with ideas um, and, and going through. There's a lot more detailed um, instructions in, in these workshops, but yeah, in room or virtually now. And now with the third phase, the opportunity canvas, this is where we start to create this customer journey. And we're outlining what are all the steps, what are all the jobs to be done in terms of the customer who wants to safely get groceries for their family. That's right. And so here we look through the we go through their journey and see what is it that's what they're what are they experiencing when they need to potentially go out and get groceries. So we see the top um, jobs to be done. So they need to potentially research the closest grocery store near them. Um, they have to see if they carry what they need and then they have to go out and shop for groceries. 
and then make their way home. So ultimately the goal is to get groceries uh, for the family safely. And these are all the various what we call moments of truth, big things that need to get done um, on their journey. So we want to tear those apart and say, okay, how do we potentially, where's our intersection that we can uh, see where we can help them in that journey solve that problem? So they're moments of truth. So in, in these moments where they they have to achieve these things, there's that they have to think they're thinking to themselves, look, I don't really want to go all the way to a crowded big box store, right? There's there's going to be potential for more exposure. There's going to be folks there that may not want to wear a mask. Um, there may be all kinds of reasons for risk. Um, um, uh, they may have someone in their household that's already got preconditions. Um, they found a place, they did some research, um, they found a place close by, um, and uh, do they have what they need? So they're online checking to see, you know, I only need essentials maybe, so do they have what I need? Um, when they shop for groceries, they're going to be worried about exposure and contacts. That's just something that when they're shopping, they potentially tend to be. Um, and then lastly, they made it home safe, um, and they didn't have to go to a crowded store. So that would be a journey, um, a successful journey, for someone looking to get uh, groceries maybe in a, during a lockdown. Yeah, and so I think that it's really important to point out here that when you come up with a concept that's really well received, oftentimes you think back to all the little details where that business has thought about the person's experience. And so that's why we say every touch point matters. And this is where along the process, you can pinpoint what are the pains that might happen throughout this journey and how can we solve it through the opportunities? That's right. So in this situation, say it's in, the, in, a, in an urban area, the parking might be a problem. Um, or maybe when they go to research it, uh, a website for a grocery store may not be up to date. Um, and so they don't know if there's anything current for what they need. Um, when they get there, they might be challenged or stressed because there's no sanitizers uh, and they don't know if the shop's actually clean. So where are the opportunities that could possibly be, be solved here? Uh, the opportunities for uh, for this is um, reserved parking or curbside pickup, uh, a website that's kept current. Maybe the local website doesn't work and it needs to be switched to an e-commerce website uh, and make sure there's sanitizers and personnel. So you can see this is a very systematic way of if we were going to if we we're going to um, make a pivot or what are the needs of our customers that we know in the neighborhood. So now we take these uh, the opportunities and we we go to. Um, what we normally call, previously called the uh, brainstorming. So those were the ideas happened to try to solve that problem. And after going through the first three canvases, these ideas will naturally come because you've already addressed the pain points and the opportunities that match them. And then in this process and in this canvas, you start to think about what provides the most value to the customer and what will provide the most value to us as a business. And so that's where desirability matches viability and feasibility. Right, so we're all in a room, ideas are coming. One of the ideas that came uh, to, to light and we, we thought was cool and, and viable was that we could do uh, online ordering with curbside pickup. We've got groceries, we've got coolers, we've got food suppliers, uh, and we're close by. So that potentially could solve a lot of the problems for our customers. Um, it's a convenient way for them to get essential groceries. Um, there, um, there may not be quality grocers in the neighborhood. If it's a, if it's an urban area, it might be corner stores with not a lot of um, um, quality produce, for example. Um, and this saves them time of exposure in, in busy places and shopping them during lockdown. So those are the potential differentiators. Uh, val the value to you as a business, you know, you're keeping your food uh, food suppliers busy and happy. Um, you're continuing to deliver food to customers, which at the end of the day is really what your business's value proposition is, right? Uh, whether they're sitting down and it's a and it's a, a five star restaurant, or whether it's um, you know it's takeout, the idea is that you're in the you're in the the um, supply chain of getting people food. So this is a, a potential pivot. So some assumptions you know we need to make is um, we'll need to be highly targeted to digital marketing. That's probably true. People don't know us to be serving groceries. We're going to have to figure out that uh, how do we get the message out? Um, and we might need to, to use uh, Instacart or one of the delivery services uh, to get the groceries into the people's hands if they don't feel like actually venturing out. So those are some things that uh, that's an idea. We know what the customer value is. We see some ways in which we can differentiate. Uh, we know our business value and then some things we need to consider. So now it's time to start to do some tests test our hypothesis. So we don't necessarily want to go and do a massive investment and change everything in case it doesn't work. We want to be lean, light, and test things 
Um, and we want to figure out how we're going to make those tests um, to validate that's the right direction to go in before we make um, large capital um, investments. And so with the experiments canvas, you're really looking at, well, what do we need in order to know that we have succeeded? And that's where we can systematically break down what are our assumptions and how are we going to measure that and how big is our sample size and how do we know that we've met success? Yeah, so in this example, um, you know, the assumptions are we all need to use highly targeted digital marketing to find customers on search engines so that when that person, person um, goes to search for groceries in the neighborhood, you know, your keywords are right. You know that you're targeting uh, in the neighborhood. So maybe it's on Google Maps, so maybe it's uh, Google search, but you want to make sure you're not advertising everywhere. You want to make sure it's, it's close to your neighborhood. So that's one of the assumptions you made, um, you know, questions you might have. It will targeting work fast enough? Are there people actually searching for groceries in the neighborhood online? I mean, that is, you know, do, do we need to validate that? Um, do we need to hire a digital marketing agency to test keywords and to do geotargeting? If that's not our specialty, that might be a way in which we figure it out quickly. Um, and then uh, sample size. Um, and then what's what's going to what's going to validate that this is actually a business uh, opportunity that we should continue to pursue. So come up with a uh, with a way in which we can value view it. So maybe it's uh, we need to hit $500 a day within a week. Ultimately, $500 isn't enough to sustain, but it's sending you a strong signal that there is something here. We should probably continue to uh, to pursue it. Um, and then, um, you know, what is the, the the threshold for how do you measure outside of the, the dollars? You know, you go back in and work with the, your team or, or an agency to see, look, they are searching for groceries and finding the website um, and to, to get here. If they're not, but they are making their way still in, you have to figure out what that channel is. Maybe they saw the sign uh, outside or some other way. So um, the key learnings, we had to change the grocery options based on what foods were being searched for online. So for example, maybe we had stocked the wrong stuff and when we checked those keywords that were being searched, we noticed that people were searching for something we didn't have um, and we're coming in and we then decided, you know what, we're going to change the type of groceries that we have to match what people are searching for. Now that experiment is one experiment, maybe it didn't work, um, but you still feel that this is strong, there was some signals there. You go back in um, and then do another, do another pass and see how do you validate it, what else do you test. So again, this framework and all these frameworks give you a step-by-step -step, instead of having to figure out um, as many entrepreneurs and business owners Quite often we do things on the fly, we have ideas on the fly, but it's sometimes hard um, when the pressure's on to make it repeatable, to give you the swindlings that you need to then be able to systematically work through things, invite more of the team members in because you've got a framework um, that you can share with others that's not all inside your head or, or you know, in your, in your ideas book and it's not all on you. So these are, the, these are the five canvases for lean business design. This is a very, very light sample of how it potentially could be used uh, in, in your business. It could also be used for the beginning of a business too. You know, you've got your business model canvas sort of you know what your value proposition is, but maybe you want to look at what are the actual product or service offerings ahead of time. It doesn't have to be just about pivoting or making adjustments to a current business model. This could be used as a foundational piece um, moving into um, a startup of a, of a, a new entrepreneurial project so we have this is about this is how it works and uh, we can quickly run this through a qu quick case study and uh, I'm not sure how much time we have but we can take some Q&A as well I imagine there probably are some questions so I'll let Priscilla walk you how we did this with the, um, the BC government we applied service design to a problem of um, uh, to restoring public trust in public consultation Thanks, JP. So I'll take a few minutes here to wrap it up with this case study. But another important note is instead of spending hundreds of people hours siloed in their own thinking, reporting back to you, this framework of lean service design really helps you save time and money and gets everyone on the same page in alignment. And that really is the value of this case study, where you're not just applying this framework to the private sector, but also in the government of BC, they were looking at how do we help people know that they have a say in public consultations. How do we ensure that trust? And so who we worked with is KPMG, TELUS, and many different departments in the government of BC, like the digital services department, uh, and also like the IT department who had really strong personalities. So one thing to note in facilitating these workshops, you can see here in the images, we also involved the public, not just the stakeholders, but we also involved the stakeholders and so as a facilitator, your job really is to 
manage the different personalities in the room and make sure the right things are being heard fairly and equally. So the next slide here will show you um, the problem really that we started off with and the problem changed throughout the project. It was about a three to four month project is when we got all the stakeholders in the room, different deputy ministers, et cetera, the problem was really how do we get quality data? You can imagine with online public consultations, there are some trolls out there. There are people who just choose to be anonymous. So it's really tough to see what data is coming in that is valid. And eventually after working through these workshops in a similar style, looking at the people, the purpose and different opportunities, we took those concepts and brought them to real people in the public and tested it. And this became a co-creation opportunity where the public said, I like this here, but this doesn't really make sense. So it was a cost effective way of really testing and experimenting back and forth between what was in the stakeholders minds and what the people really wanted. And eventually the problem shifted to be less about validating data and more about how do we know you are who you say you are. And so there's obviously technological solutions here to identify and authenticate that people are the people who they say they are. But the readiness of the public for something a little more technologically advanced didn't seem to match their need at the moment and how they trusted the BC government. So we actually provided really valuable feedback in the end based on this co-creation session where this technologically advanced uh, idea or concept was too much that for people to eventually trust that the government actually could learn everything about them. So in, in essence, this project helped provide the vehicle for them to get even more hundreds of dollars of investment funding from the federal government by proving that it actually met the needs of the current state of the public. Without committing to a huge um, multi-million dollar solution uh, and, uh, and going down the wrong path uh, too soon. I think that's about it. All right. So that's, uh, that's an example, uh, a quick example. Um, and that was a, a walkthrough of a virtual workshop. And um, if there's any questions, I think we may have a, a, a minute or two. Uh, for questions. Um, seeing any questions in the Q&A yet, uh, JP and Priscilla, um, but what I would encourage folks to do is to um, go and join them in the lounge uh, afterwards and ask questions, um, you know, about this process and how it might fit within your organization or a client's. Um, so with that, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And um, Stephen, I'll hand it to you here for a quick uh, introduction of our next speaker. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, JP and Priscilla. That was really fascinating. Um, love the Canvas uh, model, publication, so many different types of um, businesses and public sector as you outlined. It's now our pleasure to welcome Jesse Van Greensven, real based Toria, to our virtual podium today. Professor Greensven. Uh, teaches at the University of Waterloo and is also an entrepreneur and co-founder and chairman of Toria. And he and his team have taken on kind of the David versus Goliath challenge of showing the business world the opportunity to better protect and secure their conversations, their file sharing, their messaging, their video chats through an encrypted a zero knowledge platform that they call Toria. And uh, we've been enjoying using Toria within the Maple leadership team uh, for many months now. And, uh, and are excited to have uh, um, share some of the perspectives he's got on the risks associated with communication uh, these days, and especially for executives and board members. And uh, we're really grateful, Jesse, for and all the support you've given, and we're proud to have you as a as part of our community. So we'll turn it over to you now. So if you can turn your mic on, your camera on, and then um, I'll stop sharing my screen as well. Do we have you, Jesse? Do 
did we lose Jesse? There we go. Okay. Thank you, guys. Let me minimize this. I need to get the PowerPoint. Hello, everybody. I will present the risks of video communications without end-to-end -end encryption. Everybody now using video tools, and people just select the easiest one to use. And I'm going to present the risks that it is. It's not a presentation about Torium. It's a presentation about the risks that everybody's been facing without knowing it. And if we have here this association, there are a lot of uh, C-suite people. And you as a director may think, even if it is an association, that you are a board member and you have no liabilities whatsoever. This is not true. And we will see the risks that you impose on yourself and how you could avoid them. First of all, thank uh, Maple for hosting this and the panel members will be myself, uh, Stephen and Robert. Thank you very much. Before I proceed, I noticed and I included this slide that the slide is very small on this application. But there is a button that you can click, and then you will see the entire slide, and you can actually be able to read the contents of the slide, or else the slide is like 25% of the screen, and it will not be visible. So you can click that to expand, and you can also click it to shrink it back to the original size, if you so want. Present the content, the first thing is the risk and consequences of using not just video conference, but using also messaging apps. We're working away and a lot of it will stay. And this habit, I try to call people on the phone, nobody wants phone anymore. Everybody wants a video conference. And now you will see the horrible things that are happening behind the scene, you're not aware. So where we see the risks is through data leakage. Before I proceed, remember that we're talking about cybersecurity. You may not know, but it is very likely that your computer or your company server has been compromised. The reason you don't know is that the only cases that will be published are ransomware. But the majority of the attacks is to stay in your company and continue to steal information from you to use for whatever purposes. Now, where are the solutions? We'll present that to you. And then I'll make some conclusions such that we come, up, come out of this and gain something out of the presentation. Before I proceed, let me tell you just a little bit of a story here. We all, even when we were kids, watched TV shows where we have lawyers and criminals and police. And the thing that is unbreakable is this client attorney privilege. Not even judges can break that. And then I have cases that happen even with me. It's happening with everybody, I'm sure. The lawyer send a very confidential document by email. We will see that email is just like putting your secret on a postcard without an envelope. So let me ask you, would you put your bank account, your ID and your password on a postcard and send to a friend? So that's what we are all doing on a daily basis. So let's see what is the consequences. Cyber attack costs. These are direct costs. Sony, for example, two billion. Target became famous, one billion dollars expenses. 
I'm not even mentioning here the tremendous drop of capital caps, market caps on these companies. Some of them had a market cap that was 10 times larger than the expense they paid. Target had maybe around $10 billion. Furthermore, if you're a director or on a director board of one of these companies, they were never invited to be part of another board again. That was a career destruction. So board consequences, if you are a manager, if you are a director, if you just sit on a board, be it even on a nonprofit, pay attention to that. That can happen ransomware. And this is the most famous one. They will then encrypt everything and demand Bitcoins to release. And then reputation damage. Now, the reputation damage is on your company, but you're not exempt from that. It is to you privately, you're gonna be on a career destruction. You're gonna be on a lot of hassle. Don't think you are isolated. Inspect the law and you will know that's not the case. Cost millions of dollars. Even if they require from you, like they did from a hospital as an example, a million dollars, they stop it on the work, the changes they had to do later, it's unmanageable. And now this one for you as a manager, or as director, lawsuits. The lawsuits fly all over the place. And then you will have to be sitting with lawyers reading the propositions, the cases, discovery, it's gonna be months of hell. And there are many other ones that I will not cover. We don't have time for that. But you need to be aware. There are corporate liabilities and there'll be severe problems to you as well as an individual privately. So where the data leakage occur? Before I proceed, privacy drives a lot of the attacks. So you will see that 80 to 90% of the attacks happen because some privacy is discovered, exposed, and then they use that either to impersonate somebody, create what is known as a social engineer attack, and gain more access of your network. So let's see how this happens. First, we come to encryption keys. You hear about this encryption key. What the heck is this? I will explain now because all the rest, and it'll be simple, all the rest will depend on your understanding, not the entirety of encryption keys, but the basic principles, very simple. We create encryption keys, and with that keys, we scramble all our information in a way that no supercomputer on Earth or all the computers on Earth working together can decipher what was encrypted. Now, the most common way when you need, you can encrypt on your hard disk, but every time you go and need to access a server, be it your bank, be it your company, because you need to access some data, you're working remotely, for example, Every time you do this, there is a need to exchange keys. You need to give the other side, say, take this key so you can decrypt my information. The most common way to do this is uh, through something called RSA, we will see in the next slide. But the most important information on this slide is only you and the other side should have access to the keys or else it's not protected. And let's see here, in red no less, vendors, soft has the keys for your team call, for the text, for everything. Zoom has access to your keys and can tape whatever you're talking. And so does Google. So they all have access to your keys. 
The only protected system is the one that has no knowledge encryption, where the vendor has zero access to your keys. Now, this is shocking. They all have access to your keys. This is the important thing that we need to take out of here. Now, we have a key, and I need to talk to another party, be it a partner, be it the, my bank account, whatever it is, my health records. So the most common way to exchange the key is use a mechanism. Let's not discuss the details here. It's called RSA. It doesn't matter what the RSA stands for. What it matters is 90 plus percent of all key exchanges are using RSA. It's a very, right now, it is about to be broken. Imagine that we here at the University of Waterloo have a research to break RSA with quantum computers. Do not believe what people are saying, that quantum computers will only break, uh, break the RSA encryption in 10 or 20 years. This is not true. It's either about to be broken or already broken. Because if we are doing this research here to break it, imagine what the NSA or Chinese government or other foreign agents are doing and not telling anybody. So once this is broken, anybody can get your money from your bank account because they can exchange keys with the bank and pretend to be you. So we must use what is known as quantum proof encryption. People like fancy names, but it's easy to just say quantum proof. Forget about the post quantum, etc. So we must already have on our hands the key exchange, they are resistant to quantum computers. Very critical. Now let's see the data leakages. We talk about email. This is just horrible. There are companies that get a new employee, and the new employee receives the ID and the password through emails. Email is not secure. So all the hackers and foreign agents are reading, now they have an entry point to your system. And your secrets through email is uh, exposed. Messaging. We have three weeks ago in the news, the German government was caught taping and registering WhatsApp messaging. I hired here the NCC Group, one of the largest cybersecurity companies, they, uh, to check our system. And they told me that they broke Telegram, which people think is the super safe messaging. They broke it in 10 minutes the first time. Now they break those messagings, the, the systems, in seconds. So you're trusting your secrets with that. If you use Slack, Slack is not even encrypted. They're reading on the other side. And when it's not end-to-end -end encrypted, it's a crack in the armor and people can go in and read everything you're doing. <clears throat> Cloud storage, you will see a lot of the problems. I can just mention, for example, if it is open for everybody, you do not know what people in your company is storing the cloud storage. And there are other problems here that I will address with cloud storage. Serious problems. File transfer, you're transferring file back and forth and in between the transfer, people are copying your files. And now the beauty, video conferencing. We will see the major issues with this. So let's start with the email. 90%, this is documented, of the cyber attacks, they initiate by social engineering, emails. Emails are not secure. They're as, un as unsecure as an open postcard. And your secrets should not be transferred using email. Now, Zoom. Listen to this. 90% of the staff, plus more than 90%, any storage that Zoom has is in China, where at every single management level and developers, 
They don't have one person. They have an entire Chinese Communist Party committee inside Zoom. They tape the calls they save in China. There are cases you can see here on the side here. The Guardian has published a whole bunch, calls them malware. Apple caught Zoom installing spyware that has nothing to do with your video call or the quality or anything. So they had to reissue updates to the operating systems to kick out Zoom spyware. Imagine a company you trust installing spyware, spyware in your computers. So they stored this in China and they deliver the encryption keys. Remember, they hold the encryption keys to the Chinese government. This is a known fact. So the FBI forbids federal agencies from using this. So be careful here. Teams, you think a lot of directors I talked to, they just told me, oh, use Microsoft, you're safe. First of all, remember the law does not excuse you for not knowing something. Microsoft is not Apple that will fight a court order all the way to the Supreme Court for not to not release anything. Microsoft will deliver. As a matter of fact, Microsoft is the only trillion dollar company from the United States freely operating in China. Google, Facebook, etc. do not operate in China because they do not deliver the information to the Chinese government. So there are a lot of leaks, including the famous Edward Snowden, revealing the NSA has total access to all your information uh, stored or taped that you don't know it's being taped at Microsoft. So you think you're having all your secrets talking and surprise, surprise, all of a sudden you get auditors on your door and how could they know what they're specifically looking for something? Your secrets. You may not be doing anything wrong, but if you're not, why don't you give me, if you think you have nothing to hide, please text me here on the chat, your bank account, your PIN number. I dare you. Now, cloud storage, Dropbox is an example that I'll give. You may not know this, and I get this, I got this from my lawyer. Have the big file, cannot go through email. If it's something bigger than 20 megabytes, it won't go. So they put on a cloud storage and they send me the link immediately. Dropbox is authorized legally to read what you're doing and selling it to your competitor. There's nothing you can do. It's in the license agreement. So all the cloud storage systems is stored without encryption and they are they scan with artificial intelligence. They know exactly what your files have, okay? So that's the beauty of a cloud storage. How do you protect yourself? Well, to protect yourself, you need true encryption. What is true encryption? If you use Teams or you use Zoom, that's not true encryption. Or if you use Slack, if other people have the keys, this is not encrypted. You cannot have a secret where you broadcast to everybody what the secret is. So it must be end-to-end -end encrypted, no knowledge. So you messaging, I already talked to you about, people are saying, well, WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. Telegram is end-to-end -end encrypted. Be careful because the way people phrase this is totally misleading. Zoom, it's the third time they say that their system is end-to-end -end encrypted. Why they have to say it three times? They said once they were caught lying, had to admit that was not true publicly. That's their words were caught twice because the second time they said end-to-end -end encrypted, they did the following. Before I say what they did, look, if I have a Twitter account 
and I don't say stupid things on Twitter accounts. But if I, you have, or somebody has a Twitter account and say something stupid, they cancel your account, you're not paying for that. So it's vague if they could do or not. But Zoom had two paid accounts, and they're sent to end and encrypted. Two paid accounts. Talking among themselves of the paid accounts, they got their account canceled. And after the investigation went over that to find out, they had to reveal the following. They, they were talking about Tiananmen Square. They were not allowed to talk about Tiananmen Square because, and this was in the United States, look at that. They were not talking about this in China. They were talking about in the United States with paid accounts. And they said they're not allowed to talk about Tiananmen Square. The Chinese government alerted us we had to cancel the account. If it is end-to-end -end encrypted, how could the Chinese government know what they were talking about? And this is publicly available on the press, on newspapers, etc. So I'm reporting what was reported. So video conferencing, the FBI does not recommend even employees that work at any government agency to use Zoom because Zoom can be used to blackmail people working for the government, FBI words, okay? So let's say somebody's talking with a psychologist and tell the secret to the psychologist, and later on somebody can summon and say, hear your face, your voice, saying all these horrible things. You will do something you otherwise would not do for us, or else this will be leaked, okay? Tell you more, neither Teams or Zoom are HIPAA compliant, take note of that. They are not HIPAA compliant. So hospitals, clinics, they are using Teams and Zoom. This is totally irregular because they don't know, are not HIPAA compliant. I say, oh, but they have a page there saying they're HIPAA compliant. Go read the page. It's a key a mile long, and you need to install the server with the service in the hospital, for example, and you cannot communicate outside the hospital. Again, not HIPAA compliant. If you have to go through a kilometer long thing, it's not HIPAA compliant. Slack, if you look at the Slack page, the hospitals are using, it says cannot communicate any of the information of patients. Do you think the doctors read this? They trust the hospital and the clinic uh, that are giving them a tool that will satisfy regulation. And this is not a standard that people put in an association that you try to follow if you want. This is a regulation that has severe consequences. There are hospitals out there paying millions in penalties. So I recommend that you improve your password. You could use two-factor authentication. And this, for example, if you work at Google, you, you enter your password, that's not enough. You need to have a thumb drive specific one in a USB uh, drive for you to be able to log in. And this gives a lot of security because if your password is compromised, people still not get into our, your account. There are many ways to do two-factor authentication. This is just one of them. And you can use password manager. A final one here, you need to be aware of this. It's the VPN, it's the last one here. VPN, you, you just think VPN from your office. You go and access from home your office. Yes, that's VPN, virtual private network. But you can also install VPN on your phone from a provider, and this protects you from releasing. Uh, if you are, for example, go to a coffee shop, let's say Starbucks, and have free Wi-Fi, that's not secure. The moment that your computer is negotiating the Wi-Fi with the Wi-Fi, somebody, a bad actor, can go in, and then they can stay in between you and the Wi-Fi, pretending to be the Wi-Fi, and convey the information to the Wi-Fi, but it goes through them. They will compromise you, can inject even things 
in your computer or your phone. So for security, it must be a complete security. It cannot be just a portion of a security. This is like having a city that has a wall against an invader. Let's say you're in the Middle Ages and a portion of the wall is not built. So what's the point of having the wall? You must close the entire circlement of security. So end-to-end -end encryption, your devices must be protected, your computer, your iPad, your uh, smartphone, etc. And military type by great encryption and be quantum resistant. Again, RSA is either already broken or about to be broken. Finally, just to finish here, let me tell you, I know we have uh, lawyers in the association. I'll say this, it is uh, just me trying to be, uh, have humor here. The world doesn't have justice. If you go to court, it doesn't matter if you did everything right, but you didn't follow a standard, a protocol. So then you fall in the category of negligence. Somebody attacks you and penetrate. Oh, but I did everything right. Yeah, did they follow any standard? You need to follow a standard to protect yourself against the claim of being negligent. Somebody did penetrate, but I was not negligent. I followed and you name the, uh, the standard that will protect you as well. By following the standard as well, it will increase your protection level, okay? So that's it for now. It's for you to decide. I gave information. You can continue to go blindly, walking comfortably on this very dangerous cyberspace. Or you can decide to be careful on what you're doing and succeed. Don't not have the problems, the cost, the liability on your corporation and privately on yourself. So I'm uh, open for questions. I thank you very much. If you need to contact infertorio.com. Now back to you. Okay, great, great. Thank you, Jesse. Um, yeah, you know, it's uh, interesting, of course, you know, I'm, I'm imagining that this platform isn't uh, secured to that same extent either. And here we are. Um, but anyway, so I think at this point, um, you know, Stephen, if there are a few words that you wanted to share to wrap things up, that would be great. And then we'll we'll drop back into the networking um, so that we, you can have uh, a conversation. Uh, you can track down Jesse uh, in his lounge um, or around the floor. Be happy to carry on the discussion. And maybe you want to finish that discussion you were in before we uh, pulled you into our presentations. Yes. Uh, we have one question here, Rob, um, from Karen Sleeman. I don't know if you saw this, Jesse. Um, I'll, I'll take I did not. I'll read it to you. Um, she sure. writes, me in the defense sector use a more secure Zoom platform or Skype. I'm assuming they have the two-factor authentication? The, uh, uh, Zoom, no matter what you do, say a military, they put the servers in their own room. Uh, be careful. I'm talking with the, the safest cybersecurity country in the world is Israel. Um, in Israel, the safest entity is the Israeli Defense Force. So we're talking about the Israeli Defense Force because these solutions are not allowed a supplier for the IDF and the uh, uh, military manufacturer, anybody that deals. They cannot use Zoom or Teams because so if you're in the military, be very careful. This, you are outsourcing spy, you're using a what outsource spy tool for other governments. So I would not trust that two-factor authentication is not related to the video conference. It's when you are logging in and you need to make sure that it's you that is actually logging in, not somebody got access to your password. So don't trust it. Talk to your commander or whoever you talk to because it is not safe at all. Thank you. I'll throw it more. Another question here. Okay. Well, with that, 
folks, I think we'll um, we'll let you carry on with uh, with your discussions. I'm going to turn off the uh, presentation mode. Thank you, I'll Jesse. See you in the lounge. I'll be in the lounge or right hand side on the picture. Perfect. Okay.